right. All right. Sounds like we're on track, correct? Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Hi. How's everybody? It seems a little strange, doesn't it? Not having any music, but um, you know what? People have worshipped the Lord in many, 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 many different ways. And God is always praised and glorified in our worship, isn't he? As long as we are here gathered together in his name, we know the Lord. He is present among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So um, I was actually struck. And, you know, that's kind of strange for the preacher because, you know, no, I'm just kidding you all. Um, the beginning of Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its tumult. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Amen. Amen. So I've been thinking a lot about storms recently. I don't know why. You know, I mean, we had a couple of storms, didn't we? I mean, there were a couple of hurricanes. Um, it seems like there's been a lot of stormy weather going on. And you say, well, you know what? It really hasn't been that bad of a season. I mean, if, I'm, I'm not talking about Florida, okay? But here, you know, our hurricane season really wasn't too bad, was it? Do you all think it was terrible? I mean, we didn't even have a whole lot of rain. And you say, well, why do I keep saying or thinking that it's a stormy time? Well, I'm talking about spiritually. It's been a stormy time going on. There have been a lot of spiritual storms going on and waves coming through here. And we say, well, but you know, life's just been kind of tough recently, right? <coughs> ha! <laughs> we always say that, don't we? Because if we think back, is there a time when we really wasn't having a difficult time? It wasn't just hurricanes, you know, I mean, things have been difficult for a while, we say. But I think that's also partly just the nature of life, this thing that we call life, because it is uh, a bit of a battle. I mean, that's why we call it the Lord's battle. And there are always storms going on spiritually one way or another in our lives. I'm sure that you have some going on right now as well, too. But remember that we are children of God. Hallelujah. We don't focus on the storms, we focus on the Savior. We are not victims, we are victors. In Christ's victory, we are victorious as well. And this is what I want you to concentrate on today. Now, if you kind of sit there, I'm trying to give you sort of a, a mental image here as I talk a little bit. I picture this great tempest we've been talking about, so I talked about storms. It's a violent storm with waves crashing, you know, the wind is howling and it's black night. You're in a boat tossed back and forth, just a small little boat, you know, being tossed by the wind and the waves. You're unable to make any headway at the mercy of, you know, this current going on and the gale. Wave after wave crash over you. You gasp to catch your breath in between the waves. There's so much water going on. It seems like the air is full of water. And before you know it, all of a sudden, you see yourself catapulted in midair, out in slow motion almost as a wave has thrust you overboard. And you sail through the air before <clears throat> landing in the black frigid water. Its temperature snatches the breath out of your lungs before you can even inhale. You're plunging down into the deep black, deeper and deeper. The dim light that was there is growing fainter and fainter as you look up every second going down. You know that this is the end. You'll die. You're gonna drown in the cold blackness, alone without hope. This is the life of sin. The waves of life beat against you. You see the light afar off, but you can't reach it. Sometimes you feel in the little boat like you're making some progress toward the shore. It's a white shore. You think if you just row hard enough, you're gonna make it there and life will be good. And that the haze clears every once in a while, you can actually see the breakers in the distance. But then the fog moves in again and the waves get higher. You lose sight of land and you drift. 
And finally, there, sinking into the inky blackness now, fallen out of your boat, devoid not only of light, but air as well, your lungs bursting for lack of it. There with all hope lost, not knowing where you're going to be after death. You know, is it just a winking out of existence? Or worse yet, is there a lake of fire? There your eyes bulging for the last glimmer of light. All of a sudden, a great hand reaches down through the waves, grasping your waist. Your body is limp. You have no, no strength to do anything, to fight or to move at all. And you watch as this great and powerful hand lifts you up through the fathoms of sea. The water rushing past your face, making it hard to see anything. Just as your lungs are bursting, you break the surface, inhaling great gulps of air. You fly through the air, cradled in that great hand, both strong and gentle. The breeze rushes past you and it's warm and sweet. Your eyes struggle to adjust now, not to darkness, but to the brightness of a new day. No more stormy tempest is visible to you. The light is brilliant. It's a glow you've never experienced before. Ahead, someone like a son of man draws you closer to him. And it is his hand that has saved you, the one that reached down into the dark muck for you. There's a trace of blood still in his palm. And he draws you to him, embraces you with love and peace, and you know that you are home. When I read Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, that's what I see. It says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so I came up with that little thing there for you, just to show you how important that scripture is. You feel the weight of that thing there. I mean, I dramatized it. Yeah, but you know what? I don't think I dramatized it enough. He rescued us from the domain of darkness, <laughs> hallelujah, and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Like I say, I tried to make it dramatic, but I don't even think I went far enough because it was that bad for us before we knew the Lord. Yeah, I wasn't just trying to stir up your, you know, emotions or tug at you, tug at you that way. You know, we were sinking into a cesspool of a yuck. It's called sin. And he turned all that around for us, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Colossians 1, 13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. There's another scripture that we just read too as well. This one from Luke chapter 19. It said, now as he was going, they were spreading their cloaks on the road. What do you think is the significance of that? Now, you know, we know that this is this Palm Sunday that we're hearing about and they spread their palm branches on the road before the king, but they spread their cloaks on the road as well. They put them on the donkey, yes, but they put them on the road. You know, it was way back in uh, was the 1600s that it said that Sir Walter Raleigh took off his expensive cloak and threw it over a puddle so that Queen Elizabeth I wouldn't have to walk through a puddle of mud to get her feet wet. That earned him that place of chivalry, you know, in history. Although they say it's really just a legend, it wasn't true. <laughs> But even though that might have been Sir Walter Raleigh who did that, he wasn't the first one. They did it to the Lord of Hosts as well, too, in the first century, didn't they? Mm -hmm. It's very significant that they spread their cloaks before Jesus. Cloaks are very important garments. Father Bill has one in the back there. It's just really heavy. You call it a coat, right? You know, that big black coat that you have? Papa Negra. Papa Negra. Cool. I didn't even know that. Cape. Right. Black cape, Black right? Cape. And this thing is incredibly thick. It's very tightly woven wool, isn't it? And it probably weighs like a hundred pounds. <laughs> but as you wear that thing, it's almost impervious to weather. 
you could probably cover it over your head and do this, and you'd have yourself a perfect shelter right there. And that's the importance of a cloak, is that it is shelter. And for people of the first century, when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, the cloak was a very important garment to save them, to protect them. Sometimes it's probably their most important possession that they own. Think about Exodus, is Exodus from chapter 22. It says, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset, because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can he sleep in? And they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You see, cloaks are incredibly important. They use them for shelter. Remember Elijah? You know, uh, it said when he went down and he found Elisha, he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up and threw his cloak around him. And he did this symbolically to show that Elisha would take Elijah's place, that he would take his mantle, that he would take his authority, that he would take his position, represented by the cloak. You see, the act of laying down your cloak, or you could call it your stole, like this thing, or your mantle, was incredibly important. And the act of doing that <laughs> for the Lord Jesus was very, very significant. It means that you're laying your most important possession down before the Lord. You're laying it down before him. You know, in storms and shelter, we seek shelter. I mean, in storms and hurricanes, I'm sorry, we seek shelter. And a cloak wrapped around ourselves would be great for protection, wouldn't it? But you've laid down your cloak before the Lord. It's an act of surrender to him, an act of submission, an act of coming under not only your own protection, but his protection, <coughs> the mantle of Christ. And we here have all thrown down our cloaks before him. It's no longer our own shelter that we seek in a storm, it's his. You see, spiritually in this world of sin, we all need protection in the midst of the stormy tempest that goes on around us. And he came and he rescued us from that darkness, didn't he? See, brothers and sisters, you have been rescued from eternal death. And when I say rescued, I say it in past tense because it happened. It is done. It says in Colossians 4, Colossians chapter 1, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness. It's not saying that he is rescuing us. It's not saying that he will rescue us. It's saying that he did it already. <clears throat> you have been delivered from it already and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so Jesus now lives in and through you. And therefore, you have nothing to fear. I'll say that again, once again. You have nothing to fear. The cloak, the mantle of Christ, the king surrounds you and protects you. You see, we're not slaves to fear. I think a lot of times Christians tend to fall back into a fearful thing. Sometimes we call it anxiety. Sometimes we might call it issues. You know, but we don't have to stay in that place. You see, you already have it all. If you have been rescued, his fullness dwells within you already. You don't need to fear losing him or making him angry. You don't have to strive to get closer <coughs> to him. We're not working on the stepwise progress to God. He's already here with us. Because he has rescued us, past tense, done deal, finished. And you have everything that you need to make it through the storms of life. In other words, you don't need rescuing. <laughs> you don't need to live in uncertainty about what to do with your life. You can wait on the Lord and allow him to direct your steps. You can sit in quiet confidence waiting for him. You can live in a place of trust instead of distrust. You have the full armor of God now to make it through those things. 
Again, we have been rescued. It means that we aren't just holding our ground until Jesus comes back again to save you, okay? You aren't battered back and forth by the waves. You live beyond the waves now. You aren't <coughs> victims, you are victors. You have been rescued. And I know we all suffer from cares and concerns. Like I said, we call them issues sometimes. But fear and anxiety tend to be at the root of most of those things. I've had some times that have happened recently where I felt that everything could be taken away from me. I mean, everything I thought could be taken away. And I was in great fear and anxiety regarding this. And I thought, God, how can I get through this thing? And I started looking at the things that I was afraid of. And I saw that they were all things of the earth that I was afraid of losing. And I thought, well, you know what? The things of the earth are not mine anyway. They're yours, Lord. And you've just given them to me to, to use for a while while I'm here. And so do I really need those things if I have you? And I started giving up those things one by one, surrendering to them. I said, okay, if you take this away, then it's yours. If you take that away, then it's yours. And I started to get this greater perspective on things because all of that, whether it stays with you or is taken away, nothing can take away your relationship with Jesus, <coughs> your salvation. And I saw that there was no need to fear, that the anxiety melted away, that there was no more cause for me to be fearful. I laid down my cloak before him once again. So you have to surrender it to Christ. That's what throwing your cloak down before the king is. All this stuff is actually his anyway. It's not ours. He's just letting you borrow it for a while. He's very generous with that, you know. So the scriptures that we've read today are telling us to release our fear and anxiety through surrender. To be willing to say, okay, Lord, I give it up. It's all yours anyway. <clears throat> Remember, if you really pray sincerely, give us this day our daily bread, then you're saying everything I have is yours anyway, and you're responsible for providing, Lord, and I trust you for that. And he really is a faithful provider, because if you lay down those things, he's going to give them back to you. He will always take care of us, brothers and sisters. And there have been a lot of storms going on recently. I know that you've had a lot of storms in your lives. But you can be assured that you are living out his story in the world. And at the same time, you're living already in the next world. You know, the waves and the wind, they try and make us forget that we stand in heaven right now before the throne. Sometimes it's really hard to remember that, that our citizenship is there. The storms can be very distracting. <laughs> and they're always going to be storms. And so sometimes I need to remember that I have been rescued by Christ. And I am wrapped in his cloak and his shelter and his protection. Remember, we are not victims. We don't need rescuing. We are victors. Always remember that side of it. And that's who Christ the King is on this Christ the King Sunday. He is our high, high tower and our deliverer, our fortress in whom we trust. Our rescuer who draws us into his mantle of protection. Amen. Amen. Amen.